Age of Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone, everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael. And in this episode, we are going to take a look at the history of Texas in a different way than usual. One of the curious things with our history and our past is trying to understand how we relate to it and how we identify with it. Many people don't have much of an interest in the past because it seems foreign or unrelatable to our personal experience. And because there is so much happening now that it's too much to take in. How we process and deal with the past is fascinating to me, and we'll be looking at the way myth, memory, and history intersect and diverge in a few episodes. As I said, one of the remarkable and fascinating things the study of history offers us is a look into how much we have changed, and at times how little we have changed. In addition to that, when dealing with the fact that there has been rapid, accelerated change in culture and technology over the last hundred years, it is at times difficult to grasp how close we are in time to our past. The past is very foreign to recent generations because things that were a common part of our understanding, the memory and the myth part of the history, were very much still alive when my grandparents and parents, and even when I was young. As a young boy, I met a man that claimed to have entered Mexico with Pershing, an event that occurred right about the time the United States became a participant in World War I. I also used to go with my mother to visit an elderly family member, Uncle Rube, who had fought in the First World War. My grandparents and parents used to tell me stories of their lives that seemed very distant to my personal experience. And these stories became part of my historical memory, a part of my understanding of the world and where I saw myself in it. I understood the drastic change that had occurred not only since my grandparents had been young, but I also saw it happening, being born in the 70s. I saw it in my own lifetime the technological advancements and the changes in information technology really changed the world since even when I was born. And that is what we will look at here, how close we really are to the past and how far we are from it in relation to it in our modern lives. We will do this by using the life of my grandmother as a center point for this examination of the past. I could have used many people, but you will see why I chose her in a minute. This connection and proximity to historic events is something that I've discussed with Josh from the Wild West Extravaganza podcast, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about it again soon together, maybe someday even share our discussion with you. We'll see. This episode is a partial result of these discussions, and it is also in debt to my friend Melvin Edwards, a great author who has brought history alive and made it relevant in two books about his family that I strongly recommend, The Eyes of Texans and The Strength of a Thousand Sons. We live in a world that contains at least 8 billion people. It was recently headline news that we crossed that threshold. When I was born in the 70s, the world population was estimated to be about 3.7 billion people. That is a growth of 4.23 billion in half a century. My parents were born in the 1940s, and in 1950, when they were very young children, the world population was at about 2.5 billion. When my grandparents were born, the world population was between 1.6 and just below 2 billion. Just the numbers alone are mind-boggling. To drop it back in a little bit closer to our own experience, to the United States and Texas, the population has likewise followed astonishing growth and change. 
the United States population in 2020 was at over 331 million people. And Texas had a population approaching 30 million. 29, 145, 505 million people to be precise. In 1971, the United States population was at 203 million and above. And Texas had a population of 11 million. In 1950, the United States population was at 151 million. And Texas was at just over 7 million, 7.7 million. And in 1920, the United States population was at 106 million. And Texas was at 4.7 million. 6.25 6.25 times more people now live in Texas than when my grandparents were born. And 2.6 times more people live in Texas than when I was born. This explains, I think, a part of why sense of community and shared identity is harder to create over a large geography. My parents and uncles and aunts, when they were growing up, were in a way able to know or know of at least a bigger percentage of their living area population just because there were fewer people to know. Throw in instantaneous communication and social media, and it kind of is overwhelming, and we find ourselves in little bubbles of interaction and identity. Now, it's not just the number of people that has seen dramatic change. It's the way of life from the time of my grandparents were born to today that's changed. I would argue that the life that my grandparents and their grandparents and so on lived, the way it was when they were born, was closer to the way of life that people lived 50, 100, or even 200 years before than it is to the time that my daughter was born. There's a lot that has happened in the last 100 years. To illustrate this, I want to take a look at my grandparents, and specifically one grandparent. My mother was recently going through some stored papers of my granny, her mother, and she came across a little document that I had never seen before. It was a little hardbound book with a green cover and a green spine, had a painting of a woman in an apron, and a straw hat working in her front garden in front of a white house, and across the top of it, it says, My Family. Opening up the book, I can clearly see what I remember to be my grandmother's handwriting. On one of the pages, it lists her family tree. Granny was named Ruby Hargrove when she was born August 28, 1915, in Farmersville, Texas. Woodrow Wilson was president, and across the Atlantic, the great powers of Europe were trying to destroy each other. And by the time she was three, American doughboys would be sailing east across the Atlantic to try to help end the conflict. Among them would be my dad's Uncle Rube, Enlow, and a man named Louis Jordan, who I'll be soon talking about in an upcoming episode. One of them came back, the other didn't. Granny's father, Robert Lee Hargrove, was 45 years old, and her mother, Mary Elizabeth, was 35 when she was born. Her father was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1869, and her mother was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1880. The memory of Custer's last stand at Little Bighorn in 1876 was still fresh in the nation's memory, and Geronimo was still fighting in the Southwest when... She was born, and he was a little boy. And you can tell from his name, the memory and significance of the Civil War, and the ongoing event of Reconstruction, was very evident and significant to his parents. Which side my great-great-grandparents supported or what they thought of the outcome isn't hard to decipher with the name of Robert Lee Hargrove. Ruby, my granny married Raymond Davidson on October 13, 1936. Franklin D. Roosevelt was president then. And another great world war was soon to erupt across the ocean to the east. 
A man named Hitler had risen to power in Germany three years before. Now, they met, had three daughters during their marriage, and she died on September 7th, 2006 in Sanger, Texas at the age of 91 and was buried in the Bolivar Cemetery in Denton County, Texas. George W. Bush was president then, and we were involved in another couple of wars after the Twin Towers were destroyed in 2001. Now, let's step back a little bit and look at how my personal experience pushed the past into very close proximity. Now, Granny, in her book, lists her father as having been born in 1870. A documentary search shows that he was actually born October 20th, 1869. Now, the reason why he might not have had a good memory of it is because, as we'll see in a minute, he ran away when he was just a little kid and never went back home. When he was born, Ulysses S. Grant was president, having been a very instrumental part in ending the hostilities of the Civil War. And as I've mentioned, his parents named him after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee that Grant had met in 1865 at Appomattox to try to start ending the bloodshed that had left hundreds of thousands dead and injured in just four years. Robert Lee Hargrove's father, my granny's grandfather, Evans Hargrove, was born in 1827 when John Quincy Adams was president. John Quincy Adams' father, John Adams, and his friend and nemesis, politically, Thomas Jefferson, had just died the year before, in 1826, and James Madison, the architect of the United States Constitution, lived on and would die the year after Granny's grandmother, Sarah Hargrove, was born in 1835 in Tennessee. Now, she died in Texas the year that Ruby Viola Hargrove, my grandmother, was born. Right there is a pretty solid thread of identity to the time of the Founding Fathers in a pretty effortless way of looking at it. Granny's mother's parents were James Philip Wagner and Keziah Ann Wall. He was born in 1856 in Arkansas. His father was Andrew Jackson Wagner, who was born in 1821 in Tennessee, the same year that Stephen F. Austin received permission to bring settlers to Texas. Keziah was born in Arkansas in 1860, just a year before the Civil War began, to a father, Samuel T. Wall, who was born in 1835, the year the Texas Revolution hostilities broke out, and her mother, Nancy, was born in Tennessee in 1837, a year after Sam Houston and the Texians had defeated Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. My grandmother's father, Robert Lee Hargrove, lived to 1956, and her mother, Mary Elizabeth Hargrove, died in 1960, and they carried with them the stories and memories of their parents, the things they'd heard, the culture that they had lived with, and everything that came with that. When this happened, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, and we had just ended our war in Korea in 1953. And a young man from Massachusetts named John F. Kennedy would soon become president a few months after Mary Elizabeth Hargrove died. Now, Robert Lee and Mary Elizabeth had nine children. Bessie, who died according to my granny's handwriting at the age of six months, was the first. Gertie May, William, Joe Bailey, Evie, Robert Lee Jr., Ray Lee, who I remembered meeting as along with Gertie, and Ruby Viola, my granny, and her youngest sister, Jimmy B., that I knew quite well growing up. As I said, Granny was second to the youngest. I met most of these during my life. Three of them stand out really significantly. Now, Granny lists the time and place of her birth for her mother as February 8th, 1880 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and the date and place of her death as December 17th, 1960 at 2 p.m. She kept that in her memory to write down later, and she had died in her home in Sanger, Texas. For Robert Lee... She writes that he ran away from home at age of 14, and he died in the hospital in 1956. 
They were married on September 14, 1897 in Waxahachie, Texas. Granny wrote that they then lived in Farmersville before they moved to Pilot Point and then to a little community near Sanger. Robert Lee Hargrove was a farmer, and Granny wrote some interesting things about her, her father. She said that some of her earliest memories were about how hard he worked, which wasn't something that would have been uncommon for pretty much everybody at that time, living on a farm. She wrote that he had run away from home at age 14, and he played baseball in the Texas League. She wrote, he was a good pitcher, but never made it to the big league. He also played the fiddle. He was very good, she wrote. Now, when she was growing up, she recorded that she and her brothers and sisters would get into trouble by staying out too late. She wrote, I had to slip off to go to a dance where they did line dances, she recorded. And she said, I didn't get to go to Manny. As a child, for fun, she and her siblings played outside. And one of the highlights was apparently making mud pies. Now, Something very important happened in Texas in 1919 that would be significant to her life and the lives of her daughters and granddaughters and to my daughters. Texas became the first Southern state to ratify the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. And in 1920, the amendment was adopted, allowing women to vote for president for the first time ever. She was young growing up during the Great Depression, and I remember her talking to me about it. She said that they were so poor, they didn't have anything. Except she added that at the time, they didn't know they were poor because everyone she knew was in the same situation. They just were. They worked and survived. And she didn't know any other thing ex different other than that, except hard work and family. But they were happy, she said. We didn't have anything, but we were happy. A favorite trip she remembered enough to write it down was traveling to Farmersville where the family had once lived and visiting friends and family there. She also told me about making a trip to Era, Texas, a town where other Hargrove family members had lived. And the town was named after a young Hargrove relative, Era. And to make the trip, they rode in a wagon and it took a big part of the day just to get there. And because it took so long, they would always stay the night before coming home, the 15 to 20 miles that we can cover in about 20 minutes today. Her favorite holiday was Christmas. And as a child, to celebrate, they hung their stockings. And the highlight of Christmas morning was taking down the stocking and finding a piece of fruit in it. Ruby, my granny, met my grandfather, Raymond Lewis Davidson, at church in Bolivar, Texas. And he was from a little community, a little bit more to the north, called Myra. And when she first met him, she wrote, I didn't think I would never go with him. He was shy. For their first date, they went to see a silent movie in Sanger. And other highlights of their courtship would be riding in an old truck he had to Myra to visit his home and family. She lived, as I said, in the little area of Bolivar at the time. Every Saturday, they would go to the movie show. A man named Ray Odom told Granny that my young grandfather, Raymond, would let his hogs out and run them up to her parents' house so he had a reason to go see her. She wrote that she knew that she loved him the first time he kissed her, and he proposed at his house, and they were married on a Saturday in October 1936 at 8 a.m., by a Methodist preacher in Era, Texas. She was 21, and he was 24, and they had their entire lives ahead of them. She wore a plain dress, and that night after the wedding, they went to the movie show again, and then back to his house. The book has a spot for her favorite honeymoon memory, and she recorded, quote, We didn't know what a honeymoon was. They went home, began their lives together, and worked. They lived in Bolivar for 17 years before moving to a little community called Lois between Valley View and Sanger. They farmed and she worked along with them. 
and grew a huge garden every year. They each took a bath on the weekend before going to church on Sunday. She wrote this about my grandfather. He was a good husband and a good person. And he always went to church. He loved his family, end quote. Her first daughter was born in March of 1938. Granny was so scared to death, she said, when she first realized she was going to have a baby. And she had good reason, because when she had the little baby girl, she almost died. She was at home, and her mother and two other women were there to help her with the birth. It was raining when the baby was born. And it was a dangerous time because there were some really bad medical complications with the birth. The baby was fine, but she had some issues that she had to deal with. She said that she stayed in bed for two weeks and could not even put her feet on the floor. While my granddad, Raymond Davidson, worried constantly, and she wrote that he ran around wringing his hands. They named the baby Patsy after her mother's old cow. When the little girl got so mad, she would hold her breath until she almost passed out. This was something that she remembered to record. And she did this really scary habit until she was about seven years old. And at the age of three, she gave her parents a really bad fright when they went out and found her at the top of a windmill. After several years, after this really serious childbirth experience, they did have two more daughters that joined the family. My mother in 1946 and the youngest in 1948. As a father, Granny wrote that Granddad was not much help. He was always afraid something would help to us. For entertainment, the little family would go into town on Saturday, or they'd swim in the creek or play in the hayloft. I remember the barn with the hayloft when I was a little kid. It stood for several years. Special occasions that they observed were traveling to visit family members. And she wrote, we always took people with us and always took our meals. It was a different time. Even my dad remembered going on trips. There were no McDonald's or Bucky's to stop at. Now, really significant and defining moment of the United States and my grandparents' life was the Second World War. The war changed many things. Most Texans, like my grandparents, lived a rural farm life or in small towns or small communities that are around different ca- the counties of Texas. I myself live near, within a mile, of a community that would, I guess you'd call it a ghost town if there was anything left other than a church. It used to have a school, used to have stores, but all of that's gone except for the church and the cemetery. There were no super highways, and even our network of farm-to-market roads that are so common connecting us all across rural areas didn't even exist. Life was different. There was a slower pace because there was a certain speed that you topped out at. You didn't have an option. And as I argued before, and I argue again, it was much closer to what it was like a 100 years before than a 100 years after. As Georgiana Price wrote, two-thirds of Texans lived on farms, according to the census, before the war. Those farm dwellers either grew agricultural goods or worked in the production or marketing of those goods. More than 436,000 farms were in operation, averaging 261 acres in size. Typically, farming families were large, like my grandparents' family, And the census reported that 60% of the rural population was 14 years old or younger. Cotton remained central to the state's economy, as did ranching, timber, and corn. Today, Texas's rural communities are shrinking. According to the last census, more than half the state's counties, that's 143 out of 254, shed on average about 11% of their population, or 97,062 residents total. Two-thirds of these are considered rural. This also includes 15 smaller metro areas that shrank, including those around Wichita Falls and Amarillo. On the other hand, the cities of the Texas Triangle Mega Region, which is comprised of the four largest metro areas, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, 
San Antonio, and Austin were responsible for almost 88% of the state's population growth in the past decade. Before World War II, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston were the big cities in Texas, and they were small by modern standards. Dallas had about 158,000 residents in 1920 and about 260,000 by 1930. Today, Dallas has about 1.3 million. The metro population of Dallas-Fort Worth is about 6.5 million today. The entire state of Texas only had about 4.6 million people in 1920. San Antonio was the biggest city in 1920 at 161,000. Dallas, 158,000. Houston, 138,000. Fort Worth, just over 106,000. And El Paso, the fifth largest city, was at 77,560. Things have changed a lot since she was a child. Now, Granny was a very important person for me. My sister and I spent many weekends with her and Granddad, as well as many weeks in the summer. She was a hard worker, went to church every Sunday, and even when I was a little kid, that church still had an outhouse. She was very frugal, growing up in the Depression, saved everything, and used it. She didn't have a great voice for singing the hymns at church, but that didn't stop her from trying to make a joyful noise. She made the best fried chicken and fried bologna sandwiches you could hope for. She could grow anything if you gave her a little patch of ground to use, and she made full use of that area. And she could shake the shingles off the house when she snored. And she also loved wrestling. Yes, she loved wrestling. On Saturday nights, after Granddad had gone to sleep, she and I would stay up to watch the Von Erichs wrestling on TV. I think she liked the wrestling tights they wore, but she never mentioned it to me directly. That and their big muscles. I, I got a clue of that. But she also just liked the action. She really did love it when they nailed someone with the iron claw. But I digress. Point is, in her 91 years, my grandmother saw the world change drastically. When she was born in 1915, people were still grappling with Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity that he had published just 10 years before. And that same year, 1915, he published the theory of general relativity. The first commercial refrigerator had been introduced by General Electric in 1911. In 1912, Alfred Wegener had proposed the theory of one giant continent, Pangaea, after he discovered the phenomenon of continental drift in 1912. These were new ideas and new technologies. And Henry Ford had just started the first assembly line in 1913. The first radio receiver successfully received a radio transmission in 1901. The Wright brothers first gas-motored and manned airplane flight had occurred in 1903. Benjamin Holt had invented the tractor in 1904. Kellogg had invented cornflakes in 1906. Auguste and Louis Lumiere had invented color photography in 1907. The first Model T was sold in 1908. Instant coffee had been invented in 1909. Edison was experimenting with talking motion pictures in 1910. And the crossword puzzle was invented in 1913. A year after my granny was born, in 1916, radio tuners were invented that received signals from different stations. The modern zipper was patented in 1917. And tens of millions died from the Spanish flu between 1918 and 1920. And it had its effect here in Texas as well. The pop-up toaster was invented in 1919. World War I raged from 1914 to 1918. Band-Aids were invented in 1920. Insulin was invented in 1922. Clarence Birdseye invented frozen food in 1923. Notebooks with spiral bindings came about in 1924. And Fleming discovered penicillin in 1928. Walter Deemer invented bubblegum in 1928. And the jet engine was invented in 1930. Polaroid photography was invented in 1932. The FM radio was invented in 1933. The first canned beer was made in 1935. And the first jet engine was built in 1937. And Ladislaw Biro invented the ballpoint pen in 1938. The nations of the world 
fought the Second World War from 1939 to 1945. Aerosol spray cans were invented in 1941. Synthetic rubber was invented in 1943. Then a really big one came. Not that none of these were small items, but a really big, significant thing came about with the invention and use of the atomic bomb in 1945. After the Second World War, the world went through the tension of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Truman ended segregation in the armed services in 1948. Chuck Yeager and the Bell X-1 completed the first supersonic manned flight in 1947. The Wurlitzer jukebox was invented in 1948. United States troops fought in Korea from 1950 to 1953. Then, the first thermonuclear weapon was developed in 1952. Brown versus Board of Education established that segregation in public schools should end. Not that everybody agreed with it. Emmett Till was murdered in 55. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat in 1955. IBM invented the hard disk drive in 1956. Russia launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, in 1957. The Little Rock Nine were blocked from integrating into a Little Rock, Arkansas high school in 1957. And apparently some people we know in the news were present. In the 1950s and 1960s, United States military engaged in Vietnam. And following 1964, our involvement intensified until the withdrawal in the early 1970s. The first laser was invented in 1960. The Bay of Pigs invasion occurred in 1961. Freedom riders traveled throughout the South in the early 60s. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech in the 1963 March on Washington. Kennedy was shot in 1963 in Dallas. Lennon Baines Johnson from Texas signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965. Crude space flight occurred in the 1960s. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. The pocket calculator was invented in 1970. Video game consoles were developed in the 70s. Nixon resigned. My granny lost her husband. Raymond Davidson on September 4th, 1982, six days before my birthday. He was 70 years old. She sold a farm and moved to town where she involved herself with her church and her daughters and their husbands and her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The first reusable spacecraft, the space shuttle, was operating by 1982. I got to watch that launch happen in school. The same year, the first laptop computer was introduced. Multinational forces, including the United States again, intervened in Lebanon in the early 1980s. We invaded Grenada in 1983. We bombed Libya in 1986. We invaded Panama in 1989. And then the World Wide Web was in its infancy by the late 1980s, bringing us to the way of life that is so important to us today. Bluetooth was developed in the 1990s. We fought the Gulf War in 1991. We intervened in Somalia between 92 and 95. Bosnia and Croatia erupted in war from 1992 to 1995. We intervened in Haiti in 1994 and 1995. And in the late 90s, MP3 players were developed. The 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers stunned everyone. The war in Afghanistan followed and lasted from 2001 to 2021. We started intervening in Yemen in 2002. The invasion of Iraq began in 2003. Zuckerberg started Facebook in 2004, which along with the growth of the internet and social media was a very different modern equivalent to the atomic bomb and having effects that shaped our lives and is the reason that you're listening today. All these innovations and technological advancements have made it possible for me to be talking to you about our history. And then Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans in 2005. And my granny died September 7th, 2006, three days before my birthday. Now, she lived a long life, and she saw the world keep changing. From riding in a covered wagon and taking one bath a week before going to church, magic happening on a daily basis on a world is now occurring. 
Now, this is not even a close attempt to showing every important thing that happened during her lifespan. These are all high water marks or very significant things that each could be have an entire podcast devoted to. This is the world she lived through, and that world is going on today. It's still changing and evolving, and we're living our lives in it now. The important thing I'm trying to make here is remember that these events that happened in the past are still affecting the present. Today is tomorrow's history. And like Faulkner said, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. I'm going to take a quick break, pause here, and then we'll close up with some final thoughts. I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank everybody that supports me with buying me a cup of coffee through the link or on Patreon or just by sharing and rating the show. I appreciate everybody. Thanks to Derek McClendon for providing the theme music, Walking Through Texas. Be sure to go out and check out his music everywhere. And let's end the show with a song by him. I'm going to close out with Make My Heart Great Again. It's on the album Louisiana Heart, Texas Soul. And if you want to see one of the reasons that I appreciate and love Derek McClendon so much, and I love the podcast Texas River Talk, Go listen to the recent episode where Derek was a guest on that. You'll not only get to experience how great a guy he is, but you'll also get to hear some unreleased music that's not been heard anywhere except live shows and on Texas River Talk. So go give them a listen. Thanks to everybody again that listens to the show. Share it with your friends. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. And I'm gonna build a wall around my heart So you can't ever get back in I should have known it from the start I learned my lesson once again Border of my soul was open, don't you know? It was open, don't you know? But I let you through, knowing what you do. I knew just what you do. Put a fortress in between And I'll make it touch the sky I'll build it out of broken dreams So you'll have to learn to fly Ever wanna see how good it used to be? How good it used to be? You have to look it up in your memory, cause there's only memory. admit you never would commit 
you never could commit All the running around in line All the breaking down and crying Now I'm leaving town and trying To build a wall around my heart So you can't ever get Should have known it from the start I've learned my lesson once again